So first of all, can we do a sound check? Can you hear me? Too loud, too quiet? Just about right. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here at this excellent course. And I'd like to begin by thanking all of these people who actually did all of the work that I'm going to talk to you about today. There's a trivial change of title, but you don't need to worry about that. Okay, so let's just tell you what I'm going to tell you in the next 40 minutes. I'm going to try and deal with four questions. I'm going to discuss whether volition is prospective or retrospective. I'm going to talk about the particular role of action selection. That means selecting what action to make, choosing between action alternatives. I'm going to talk about the particular role of action selection in our experience of intention and of volition. I'm then going to move from switching about volition and intention to talking about agency. And agency refers to the sense that you are in control both of your own bodily movements and also of events in the external world. So when you press the button and the slide changes or when you press the button and the light goes on, you may have a sense of agency. And I'll talk about the role of action selection in developing a sense of agency. And then we were invited to make problematic causal speculation, so I'll try and do that at the end, but there's only one slide. So, um, is volition prospective or retrospective? Well, um, let me perhaps begin by showing you what should be fairly familiar, I think, to many of you, which is the standard way that people in the control of action and um, motor neuroscience think about actions and about voluntary actions. So this is the standard computational model. It's an engineering model. Uh, it was originally developed for things like controlling the temperature of power furnaces, and it's now used for voluntary action. So you always begin with something rather undefined called a goal, and your first job is to use a planner or an inverse model, given that you have a goal, to work out what particular motor command you're going to use to achieve it. So this is the uh, transformation from ends to means. And this motor command is sent to your body, and there's an action, and your action may have an effect in the outside world. And the important point to note is that you can divide these models into two basic sort of sections. The first one is the sensory feedback section, which, where your action has an effect on the outside world, which is fed back through this outer loop. We call that retrospective, because you don't know anything until the feedback comes in. The prospective section here in yellow is everything which is, if you like, inside the head. So at the same time that you formulate your plan to achieve your goal, you can make a simulation using a forward model to predict whether it's going to work or not. Now, the, um, the distinction between prospective and retrospective awareness of action is really, really important. So one of the things which is going on quite um, vigorously at the moment is the discussion about whether you know what you're doing, because if you don't, if you only know about what you're doing after you've done it, then that poses some serious um, questions for the notion of responsibility on which all our social and legal systems throughout the world are based. So that may be important. Now, I'm hoping in this environment I don't need to explain the limit experiment. OK, very quick. Um, th there's a rotating clock which serves as a temporal metric for you to measure your own internal stream of consciousness. At a time of your own choosing, you make a voluntary action. In the case of our experiments, it's pressing a button. And the clock continues to rotate. It stops in a random location. And then you're asked to report where the clock hand was when you had a particular conscious experience. And the experience which has attracted most attention is when did you experience the urge to press the button? Or when did you have this experience of will to make the, to make the action? And the second part of the experiment is that you can record the EEG readiness potential over the motor areas of the brain throughout this process. And the Libet experiment is really just one result, which is that if you time lock the, the EEG to the moment at which the button actually goes down, that's shown here as zero, and um, you show the uh, brain activity over the frontal motor areas of the brain here, negative is always shown up in EEG, you see this readiness potential growing, which is the brain preparing for an action. And the readiness potential begins often a second before the action itself occurs. But the average time at which people report what Libet called the W judgment, the experience of will, I would call it awareness of intention, occurs here, 206 milliseconds before the button goes down. So the point is that there's a gap between the point at which the, ready, the time at which the readiness potential starts here and the time at which you become aware that you're about to press the button. This gap is often over a second long. In brain terms, that's long. So the point about the uh, limit experiment is it seems to suggest that 
my conscious will cannot possibly be the cause of my actions. Rather, the brain is causing my actions, and I only know that I'm about to make them just before I actually do. So in what sense am I in control of my voluntary actions? Clearly, it's my brain. So this, is, this has led to a lot of interesting suggestions that you could have this debate with a police officer if you get arrested for doing something wrong. I don't think the police officer is going to give you much time. Now, um, therefore, I think the, the, the interpretation of the Libet experiment is that the classic way, perhaps the Cartesian view of voluntary action, namely that we have conscious thoughts and, and reasons which produce conscious intentions, which may use brain activity as a mechanism to produce our actions and our body movements, this is simply wrong. It's too dualist. It requires, on some, it requires some form of consciousness to neurophysiological causation that we just don't like. And at the moment, the dominant view in the field, um, well, sorry, the, the, result, the, the, the result that Libet then uh, proposed is much more like this, that there's brain activity which causes body movement. So this might be a readiness potential. This might lead to a motor command descending the corticospinal tracts. And the brain activity that causes body movement also causes a little bit like a carbon copy on an email, causes our conscious experience that we're about to act. And a lot of people don't like this either, because a lot of people say, well, the consciousness is it's, it's useless. It's just an epiphenomenon. It's just a byproduct. It's not involved in the main causal path. It can't be anything to do with our actions. Why do we have it at all? That's a perfectly reasonable question. And instead, the view that, that sort of dominates, and I think it's not wrong to attribute this to um, people like uh, um, Daniel Wegner, um, Dan Dennett, um, and David Eagleman, is that really our conscious intentions, our feeling of what we're about to do, our feeling that we decide our own actions is simply a post-fiction. And this is a much stronger word that it's actually just a confabulation. So on this sort of view, our brain activity causes the motor areas of the brain to become active and this causes our body movements. Our body then moves and we get sensory feedback. And we say, oh, Patrick, you must have meant to do that. That's why the lights came on. It's okay. There's nothing funny going on. You plan to switch on the light. So you retrospectively post a conscious intention and insert it back in time into the stream of events so that you have an explanation for all the funny things that you find yourself doing. Now, I think there's a real problem with this kind of strongly retrospectivist, right? So you can see this is retrospectivist because it's all driven by this post-fiction from sensory feedback. There's a real problem for that view, which comes from this very rare uh, class of experimental evidence from direct stimulation of the human brain. And the key person here is Itzhak Fried, who works in uh, UCLA. So in uh, neurosurgery for um, intractable epilepsy, uh, grids are implanted directly on the cortical surface. And when they stimulate through these electrodes in order to check that, they're, that they know where they are in the brain and they're not going to cut out the wrong area and they um, are going to cut out the right area, um, when they stimulate over the supplementary motor area, which is here immediately in front of the main motor output areas of the brain, the patient who is completely awake and completely conscious and simply sitting still in a chair and asked to report what they feel will say things like, I feel I really want to move my right arm. They will report what comes in the literature under this name, urge. So the word urge is a funny word which comes up again and again in the literature on voluntary action. Um, so people will experience an anticipatory awareness which seems a little bit like, from the verbal report, the experience of intention or the experience of volition. It seems a little bit like the experience of, I want to do something and I'm about to do it. And critically, at this point, they have not actually yet moved at all. So how would they be retrospectively able to confabulate this urge, given that they've had no sensory event which might lead them to feel that they were about to move? It looks as though this conscious experience which they describe as urge is coming directly from the bits of the brain which are involved in planning and preparing the action, the prospective bits, and not from the retrospective bits driven by sensory feedback of the, uh, of the body actually moving. And the interesting finding is if you actually turn up the stimulating current through the exactly the same electrodes, then the person will move. So they'll have an experience which is prospective, but it looks as though that experience is generated within a mechanism which is part and parcel of the normal route for actual movement. And this, to me, suggests that, there, that there's a prospective awareness which is um, of action which is provided by the uh, frontal uh, motor systems. Now, I'm just going to take you um, briefly onto some um, more recent work, which is suggesting that the experience of intention and the, the experience of what we're about to do is profoundly linked to the question of, am I going to do A or B? 
am I going to select this action or the other? It's concerned, if you like, with what one might call free choice. So there are many different aspects to the way we uh, act. We, re we recently wrote a paper called the What, When, Whether Model of Intentional Action. When you make an action, you need to decide what to do, when to do it, and whether you're actually going to do, do it at all or just do nothing. So what I want to do is describe some data which suggests that the process of selecting between alternative actions drives the experience of action. So here is the standard readiness potential which I've shown you before, and here is the standard Libet number that people experience the intention to act uh, just before they, uh, they press the button and after the readiness potential starts. Well, we did a very simple experiment with Martin Eimer many years ago now, where we made the Libet experiment twice as interesting, because now we gave you two buttons, and you had a completely free choice to do this or do this. And it just was transformationally interesting for the participants. I'm being a bit glib, because in fact, Although these experiments seem very interesting and important, the fact of thinking about pressing a button for an hour is rather dull. So when you give people a choice over whether to press a button with their right hand or with their left hand, you can measure what's called the lateralized readiness potential. Because what you find is that in the later stages of action preparation, just before the button is actually pressed, you see a larger potential over the contralateral hemisphere of the cortex relative to the ipsilateral hemisphere of the cortex. So what you can see is that the brain preparation begins when the readiness potential starts. Let's say it's roughly here. But at some later stage, partway through preparation, there's a divergence with one hemisphere becoming more active than the other. And simply subtracting those two curves, you can calculate the onset of the lateralized readiness potential, which is the difference between the, the activity in the hemisphere that will do the job of making the action and the one that won't. So we gave people a, a, a task in which they could freely select to use their left hand, which is controlled by the right hemisphere, which is measured by this green C4 electrode, or their right hand, which is measured by this pink C3 electrode, okay, so contralateral control. So you freely select whether to make a left or a right action in the standard Libet experiment. And as before, you get, for each trial, a time at which the subject says, well, I think I decided to move or I felt the urge to move when the clock was at such and such a position on the dial. And we can use, we can register those subjective reports onto a timeline locked to the key press. And it turns out there's a very wide distribution at the time at which people report this feeling of will. It's by no means consistent. It's a very, very big standard deviation. And we can use that standard deviation to look at a distribution where on some trials they'll have a very early awareness of urge and on some trials they'll have a rather late awareness of urge. And now we're going to use uh, Mill's method of concomitant variation, which is the standard trick for identifying causal relations. Causes and effects should co-vary. So we can find what is the cause of the awareness of intention by looking for brain mechanisms which occur early when people have an early awareness of intention and which occur late when people have a late awareness of intention. So we're going to use this random variation in the timing at which people experience their own volition to look for the underlying brain mechanism. So we're simply going to median split each person's data into the 50% of trials where they have a relatively early experience of their own volition and the 50% of trials where it's relatively late. Now, if we look at the standard readiness potential, which is just measured over this midline of the brain and which is a sort of the gold standard index of neural preparation, we can ask whether the trials where they have an early awareness of intention, which are in here in red, also have an early readiness potential, and whether the trials with a late awareness of intention here in blue also have a late readiness potential. And the answer is they absolutely don't. So by Mill's method, this would seem to suggest that whatever the readiness potential is, it's not the thing which causes the feeling that you're about to do something. Okay, so we've ruled out one potential cause. Just for the sort of um, interested among you, these dashed lines are the typical times of uh, people reporting early awareness of intention in our experiment, and, the, and in blue, people reporting a late awareness of intention. You'll see that there's big gaps between when the brain activity occurs and when the conscious experience occurs, but I don't want to go into those now. A lot of that's got to do with the difficulty of trying to use a clock to report your own internal stream of consciousness. Now, this is the lateralized readiness potential. Remember that this is the difference between whichever hemisphere is actually going to do the job of moving the opposite hand and the hemisphere which isn't doing the job. So this is a very noisy potential, but it's an interesting one. If you look 
several seconds before the point where the key is at, where the button actually goes down, you'll see the lateral, lateralized readiness potential is at zero. And that's because although the brain is preparing, it hasn't yet specifically shifted the preparation into one hemisphere rather than the other, perhaps because you don't yet know what you're going to do. But around a second or so before you actually press the button, you see this strong deflection of the lateralized radiance potential such that you get a few microvolts more activity in the contralateral hemisphere than in the ipsilateral hemisphere. And the critical point to note here is that if you look at the red line, which is the LRP for the trials where you had a very early awareness of intention, it leads the blue line which is the line for the trials where you had a late awareness of intention, over this critical period of deflection just before you move. So the thing we were looking for in Mill's concomitant me method of variation is, does the red precede the blue? And you can see that during the phase of preparing exactly whether you're going to do this or do this, it does. So the conscious intention seems to correlate, not just with a general feeling of preparation, but with the specific stage of motor neurophysiological preparation where the brain is getting ready to do A rather than B, left rather than right. Only, therefore, after you've actually selected exactly what means you're going to use to achieve the ends of pressing the button. The point at which we seem to become aware is the point at which our action intentions, if you like, become concrete. I'm going to do it this way. Okay? Now, I want to shift from talking about volition and will, which are all sort of interesting but problematic, to talking about the sense of control, the sense of agency, the sense that we have of being in control of what we're doing and of our own lives, if you like. And I want to suggest that there's an important role of action selection, this same process of choosing what to do, also in that process. Now, I'm missing a very, very left part of the screen, but I think it doesn't matter. This is going back to the standard comparator model, which is the way that we think in computational neuroscience um, about the control of action. And it was noted by um, Daniel Wolpert that these models could be, and Chris Frith, that these models could be used to make judgments of agency as well as to actually control actions. Because when you send a motor command to your body and take an internal copy to make a prediction of how that motor command will actually cause you to move, you then have a predictive signal which you can compare with the retrospective sensory feedback in your perception of the outside world. So, for example, if I, put, if I uh, press the light switch, I may be able to predict that the lights will come on, and then perhaps some, second, uh, some hundreds of milliseconds later, I'll get information coming back from the external world through the retina and through the visual system, which will show me that the lights came on. So this little um, box here is simply a comparator which compares the predicted effects of your intentional action and of your motor command to the actual effects of your motor command. And if these two are exactly the same, if what you predicted and what, you, what actually occurred are exactly the same, this little comparator subtractor will produce zero error. So you'll get no prediction error. And that means that the thing that's happened is something that you did. You're in control. It's fine. You press the button. The lights went on. You feel completely in control, and everything's fine. If, on the other hand, this, this produces a non-zero uh, error at this comparator, some there's an error signal, then this implies that this prediction error means that something's happened which was not caused by you. Whatever has occurred in the external world is a feature of perhaps of some other cause and not your own agency. Now, therefore, there are a couple of points which are interesting about these models. The first one is there's no positive signal for being in control. There's only a negative signal when, something, when somebody else is in control or some, there's some other cause. So you shouldn't, one might ask, well, why do, you, why do you have any positive phenomenology of your own agency? That's an interesting question. But perhaps a more interesting question is that you can't possibly have agency until you get this sensory feedback after a delay because it takes time for the lights to go on and for your retina to tell you that the lights have gone on. So agency must be computed post hoc and retrospectively on this view. And I want to just suggest to you that there's a second aspect to the sense of agency, which has perhaps been overlooked, which is that maybe just at the point that you plan what to do, just at the point that you select, I'm going to press with my right hand or with my left, maybe that's enough. Maybe prospectively, when you say, oh, I know what to do, maybe that's enough to give you something which serves as a feeling of control, feels like I'm in control. These are ticket machines from all around the world. And I don't know if there's a Montreal one there because I haven't yet had the chance to use the Montreal Metro. But uh, here is Barcelona. Here is, uh, I think that may be New York. Uh, there's a London one somewhere. Um, 
And this is the London one, I think. Now, for most of you, some of these ticket machines, you will be great. You'll walk up to them, you say, I know what to do. Press, single, this zone, yes, two dollars, no problem. And there are others of these machines which will fill you with terror. <laughs> and you'll stand in front of them and you'll think, my goodness, what on earth do I do now? And there'll be somebody behind you who's tapping their feet and twiddling their thumbs and tutting, and suddenly uh, you'll have lots of problems. So the point here is something which you just which technology perhaps uh, shows us rather clearly, that sometimes we just know what the right thing is to do, and sometimes we don't. We feel a strong sense of control when we, when we can approach the machine with the knowledge that we're going to select the right action, and we feel a total lack of control when we don't know what button to press. Now, I want to use the term intentional fluency to refer to that feeling of, oh, yes, I just know what to do. And I want to suggest that there's a metacognitive readout of the selection processes in the frontal part of the brain which give us this information, yes, press left, press for a single, press for a return ticket, and that somehow those generate some kind of experience of control. And the way that we did this was using some subliminal priming experiments a couple of years ago in which we showed that subliminal priming, which makes it easy for people to select whether to press with their right hand or whether to press with their left hand, just helping them to select the right action with a subliminal prime, already gave them a stronger experience of control and agency over what happened as a result of that button press. So people are just pressing buttons. They're being primed by something that they never even see. But if we help them with our primes, they feel they have more control over what goes on. How does it work? Well, you start off with a fixation cross, you get a very, very short prime, which is an arrow pointing to the left or the right, uh, for 17 milliseconds. And we show that we, you don't see this. I won't go into how we show that unless people want to know, but basically people don't see this. Then this is followed shortly afterwards by a much larger arrow, and you'll see that it sort of acts as a mask, which suppresses the conscious perception of the prime. And the much larger arrow can point to the left or the right, just as the prime can point to the left or the right. So your job, really, is to look out for this big arrow. If it points to the left, then make a response with your left hand. If it points to the right, then make a response with your right hand. And shortly after you've done that, you'll see a color patch on the screen. And there's a whole range of different colors. There are quite a lot of colors. I'll come on, come on to them later. And your task at the end of the trial is to say, how much control did you have over what appeared on the screen after you pressed the button? Okay? So people are judging their sense of agency over the colors that they're making appear on the screen with their own button presses. And this is just a simple Likert scale. Now, um, this is just some technical detail. And the important point is that the um, sense of control judgment is based on a number of different things. It's based on the relations between the hands and the colors. So some colors are shown after left-hand actions, and some colors are shown after right-hand actions. It's based on a delay that we insert between the uh, instruction, between this supraliminal target telling you to go left or right, and then the color appearing. But the critical thing is that some of these colors are shown in cases where you have been compatibly primed, as here. So you were primed to the left, you didn't see it, you were then told to go to the left, and this particular combination of compatible priming would have been followed by a red color. Whereas some of the colors, in this case the yellow color, are associated with incompatibly primed trials. So here you were primed to the right, you didn't see it, you were then told to go to the left, and now you get a yellow color. And the critical point is, does priming people so that they select the right action when they get the target either very easily if they've been compatibly primed, or in some sense with more conflict if they've been incompatibly primed, does that affect how much control they feel over what happens next? So I'm prefiguring the fact that the answer is yes. But the critical point is that the primes by themselves do not predict an effect, effects. So simply the fact that you were left primed doesn't automatically by itself predict that you're going to get a red color, because what actually predicts the red color is the combination of the left prime and the left target. Not the prime by itself, not the target by itself, but the fact that you are primed compatibly or incompatibly. So the idea is that compatible primes increase fluency of action selection without actually giving you any statistical ability to predict what's going to happen. 
If you look at the reaction time to press the button in response to the big arrow, unsurprisingly, people are faster when they've been compatibly primed than when they've been incompatibly primed. And if you look at their judgments on the Likert scale of how much control they feel over what happens next, surprisingly, people feel much stronger, well, much smaller on a Likert scale, but highly statistically reliable and replicated across a number of experiments. People feel more in control of what happens on the screen after they press the button when they've been compatibly primed to press the left button or the right button compared to when they've been incompatibly primed. So the, remember, they're not seeing the primes at all. We're doing something to the way that they select the action, which is helping them to feel more in control of, well, their lives, what happens next. It's not a visual experience. It's something to do with being able to quickly, quickly get to, oh yes, left or right. So the concept is that action priming is facilitating fluent action selection. And this is responsible, for, or this is contributing to the sense of control. And this has got to be prospective. There's nothing, I think, about the retrospective side of action control which could explain this result. You're not predicting the effects, and it's not easily explained by retrospection. So the way that we, or one contribu contribution to the sense of control that we feel over our actions, actually comes from how we get to them, how we select them in the first place. Um, how much longer have I got? Five minutes? Two minutes? Pardon? Another more 10 minutes, oh goodness. So now we did an fMRI experiment in which we used an event-related approach to use a model so that we can get a regressor which just focuses on this phase in the trial where people are selecting which, which action to make. And we found a strong activation in the angular gyrus in the right side. So this is the posterior parietal cortex. Here's the front, here's the back. This is the parietal cortex. And like many other people before, we found that the angular gyrus shows a strong activation when people feel a low sense of control. So we've simply split each person's control ratings on the Likert scale into tertiles of low, medium, and high control. And a progressive deactivation of the angular gyrus as you feel more and more sense of control over what's going on. So the angular gyrus is one of these not me brain areas. It wasn't me. It was some other cause. But there are two interesting findings about this. The first is that the angular gyrus only seems to code for this it wasn't me aspect of I'm not in control in the cases where people have been incompatibly primed. And it seems to do nothing at all in the cases where they've been compatibly primed. So when you know what's going on, when you just know what to do, when you can say, oh yes, it's a left-hand trial, when you fluently select the right action, this posterior parietal cortex activation is not particularly interested. But when something's funny, when you're thinking left, but then you get told to go right, when, you, when you're sort of in ambiguity about what you're actually going to do, when action selection's complicated, you get this coding for not me. So this is, this is in itself not particularly different from other work by uh, Chloe Farrer and other people, except that it's all happening in terms of action selection. There's nothing retrospective here. The angular gyrus and the posterior parietal cortex seem to be estimating or contributing to your sense of control before you've even pressed the button, and certainly before you actually get the feedback which tells you how much statistical control you really have over your external environment. So it's prospective. And there's a connectivity result as well, which is that we think that we find that there's a stronger connectivity between the frontal cortex, dorsolateral prefrontal, and the angular gyrus in these conflicting not-me conditions. So the underlying model that might come out of this is that maybe the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex somehow monitors, or, or, or which well, we know it's involved in action selection, but maybe it's sending a signal from the frontal cortex back to the parietal cortex, such that the parietal angular gyrus is monitoring the frontal processes of action selection and thus producing this subjective sense of control or lack of it. Now, we've talked about causal interventions, or we heard about causal interventions in John's uh, talk, so really, fMRI is not very good for identifying what an area does. So we did a TMS experiment. We've got a figure of eight TMS coil, and we're going to deliver a single TMS pulse over the angular gyrus in the right hemisphere, either at the time um, that you see the big arrow and press the button 70 milliseconds later after this, after this big arrow is shown, so roughly at the time that action selection is really active, or later in the trial, at the time that you actually get this retrospective picture of the color effect of your action which appears on the screen. 
So we're going to try and knock out this area, either at the time that we think the prospective arm of the circuit or at the time we think the retrospective arm of the circuit is active. Now, let's just focus here on this area which is shown here in blue rectangle. What I've shown here is the control ratings on the Likert scale, how much control do you feel over what happens on the screen, when we apply a TMS pulse at the time of the effect of your action, at the time that you've already pressed the button and this color appears on the screen. And if you knock out the angular gyrus at the time of knowing about the retrospective effects of your action, you can see that we have really no influence whatsoever on our compatibility priming effect. Because once again, we get a stronger sense of control when people have been compatibly primed, that's this light gray column here, compared to when they've been incompatibly primed over what to do. So whatever it is that action selection is doing to your sense of control, it's not doing it at the time that you see the color, because knocking out the relevant brain area at the time that you see the color has no influence whatsoever on the compatibility effect on priming. But if we now show here in this green rectangle what happens if we knock out the posterior parietal cortex with a single TMS pulse at the time when you're actually selecting which action you're going to do, then we can see that we can completely suppress the increased sense of control that you'll feel over the subsequent color um, as a result of compatible priming. So whatever it is that compatible priming is doing to give you this feeling of being in control, it's doing it in the posterior parietal cortex at the time that you're actually choosing which button press to make. That's just saying what I've said. OK, so I think this is the last, uh, right, this is the last experiment. So what about freedom? What about free choice? What about selecting between alternative actions? This is a, this is a um, very recent experiment where we have the similar kinds of conditions that I showed you before, where we're going to cue people with this big arrow to go left or to go right, and we're going to have a compatible or incompatible preceding prime. But we're going to add this rather interesting condition where you get a preceding prime, which once again you don't see, and then you get a double-headed arrow. And the double-headed arrow means it's up to you. You can press with the left hand or you can press with the right hand. Choose for yourself. In the long run, try and make it interesting. Don't just press left throughout the experiment. Try and press right sometimes and left sometimes. But it's up to you on any given trial what you do. So the idea here is that people are freely selecting. This may be some sort of analog of free choice. When you've pressed the button um, in every condition, you once again get a color which appears on the screen, and you get asked to judge how much control. And uh, we did this in, in Berlin with uh, Martin Voss, who is a psychiatrist and was uh, able to allow us to test both healthy volunteers and patients uh, with a diagnosis of schizophrenia who had positive symptoms and delusions of control. Now, what I'm going to show you here is just what happens when we show people what to do. So we're giving them a big arrow, which is a cue, telling them, please go left, please go right. And if you look, first of all, um, in the uh, black data, these are the healthy volunteers. So these are the reaction times to press the button. And once again, we find that when we compatibly prime the healthy volunteers, they respond faster than when we incompatibly prime them. So giving them this little subliminal cue helps them to select the right action. We've made them fluent in intentional selection. And if we look in white at the schizophrenic patients, it's interesting that you can prime them as well. So if you help a schizophrenic patient to go left or go right by presenting a subliminal prime, that works. They're great. They can, they can get the information from the primes. They can't consciously see them, but they can use the information from the primes to help their action selection. Now, the interesting thing is that this works also in the case of the double-headed arrow, where the person has a free choice over what to do. So what I, this is a little bit sort of tricksy, because what I'm now doing is I'm now using compatible to mean we showed you a left subliminal prime, then we showed you a double-headed arrow, and you happened to choose to respond with your left hand. And incompatible means we showed you a left subliminal prime, we showed you a double-headed arrow, and you happened to choose to respond with your right hand. So what you can see is that, first of all, the reaction times are overall slightly higher when people choose compared to when they're told what to do. But once again, we can see that, that the compatible responses are slightly faster than the incompatible ones, both for the controls in black and for the schizophrenics in white. So again, subliminal priming helps action selection. OK. So we've got a subliminal priming of sense of agency in controls. OK, so oh, sorry, now I should, I should, I should this, is a profound, sorry, this is a profound change of graph, which I didn't draw your attention to. 
Now what I'm showing you is the agency rating. So I've stopped talking about the reaction times, and I've talked about the sense of control that people feel over the color that appears on the screen afterwards. So these are these Likert scale numbers, how much control you feel. And what you can see, as I've outlined for you here in, in, in green, is that subliminal priming, once again, helps the sense of, of agency in the control volunteers. They feel a stronger sense of control over the colors that appear on the screen when they're compatibly primed here than when they're incompatibly primed, both for cue choices where they're told which button to press and also in free choices where they make up their own mind about which button to press. But the interesting thing is that schizophrenic patients don't show that at all. So the schizophrenic patients respond faster when they see the prime they're using the information in the prime. It's helping their action selection, but it doesn't enter into their experience of control at all. It works objectively on their information processing of action selection, but they're not getting any subjective experience of, oh yes, I know what to do. They're not getting any monitoring, or they're not doing any monitoring of their own frontal action selection processes. They don't seem to be tracking where the ideas, if you like, are coming into their head. And I think this is the last data slide. The, um, this is just, again, going back to the angular gyrus. So if we look here at force choices and here at double-headed arrows, free choices, once again, we get activation of the angular gyrus at the time of action selection. And I've shown you here that, once again, it's not me coding because you get stronger activation of the angular gyrus when you feel a low sense of control. And a, uh, sorry, when you feel a high sense of control and a, a strong... You get, you get stronger activation of the angular gyrus when you feel out of control compared to when you feel in control. But the interesting point is that if we now look at the uh, patients, so what you're looking for is this blue line being lower than the, and diagonal relative to the red wine line, but you don't see that at all in the schizophrenic patients. They don't seem to be using this frontal parietal link to actually say, oh, that was a funny idea. Th that, that selection came in the wrong way. There's something disfluent about how you're getting to your own action. So all of those mechanisms are working reasonably well on the objective side of changing their behavior, causing their motor responses to be faster or slower, but they don't seem to be actually experiencing them as being, that's, um, I know what to do. So just this is a, in lieu of a conclusion slide, what's this all about? Why do we know what we're doing anyway? Well, it's very difficult to speculate on the functions of action awareness. So you've given me the difficult task of talking about causal mechanisms. So these are just intuitions. So what I think I've shown is that conscious volition and conscious agency are both, at least partly, driven by prospective action selection processes. I wouldn't rule out the retrospective story. That definitely is correct. It's true that we do, to some extent, retrospectively invent narratives of our own volition, but not only retrospectively. There's also a prospective component. That's a rather unfashionable <laughs> view. These, these, so we have prospective experiences which are not merely retrospective confabulations. Now, why? I think it's tricky to say that action experience is all about conscious control. It's a bit too dualist. So maybe the reason why we have a prospective experience of what we're doing now is not to allow us to control what we're going to do now, but to provide some sort of experiential marker which will be useful if we screw up. I remembered what it felt like, and I remembered that when I did that last time, it hurt, or she was upset, and I'm not going to do it again. It's just a suggestion, but action experience may be a phenomenal marker as part of instrumental learning, which may be relevant for, for example, episodic retrieval, so that you may have some sort of strong phenomenal intuitions about what to do next time. Now, I've talked a lot about agency and conscious experience, but those of you with an animal background will notice that everything that I've been doing is basically instrumental learning, right? So it's quite possible that a rat in a Skinner box pressing a button gets many of the phenomenologies that I've been talking about here. And I think there's a great tendency in, in volition and voluntary action to, to really ignore the role of learning and memory in the everyday way that we use our action flexibility to make one action rather than another. So the concept here is that our experience, our phenomenal experience of volition and action may be part of the instrumental learning process. And if that's true, then I think that's interesting because it suggests that the subjective experience of what you're doing really plays an essential role in becoming responsible and in being responsible. Thank you very much.